Um, also in the 17th century, Asiatics came to rule over Egypt. These are the famous Hyksos. You'll see all these names up later in a chart I'm going to give you. From their center of Avaris, excavated by Manfred Bitak, who was here. Later, anti-Hyksos propaganda from Egypt says nasty things about them that you wouldn't trust, but I still have to mention. It says they ruled without the sun god and they worshipped only the storm god. Now, most people think this is the exuberantly polytheistic Egyptians saying, look at these terrible people. They worshipped only one god. You may know or may not know that the word atheist was coined by the Romans to describe Jews and Christians who worshipped almost no gods, if you see what I mean. So, um, but so you could argue there was some hint of monotheism of these Asiatic Hyksos who ruled Egypt. The foundation of their capital of Avaris, or Tanis, is even mentioned in the Bible, Numbers 13.22. The Israelites knew something about that. And one of their rulers was named Yaakov Har. We're not sure about the second element, whether it's Har or El, but if it's Har, it means mountain. But Yaakov is the name of Jacob. There are other Yaakovs in the documentary record. It's not unique to these two men, but isn't it funny that the father of the uh, viceroy of Egypt in the Bible bears a name that we know was the name of a Hyksos ruler of Egypt? Okay, in the 16th century, the Hyksos were expelled from Egypt. We have these Asiatic peoples, among whom is a name like Yaakov and other names that sound somewhat like Hebrew, being kicked out of Egypt. And some sources, to show that this was such a portentous, favorable event from the gods, describe meteorological phenomena, not in great detail, but there was unusual rainstorms or something like that. Um, now, I always wondered how they could really ec ethnically cleanse the Hyksos so thoroughly. And in fact, Professor Betok said that we can show that, and others say this too, that when the, the expulsion of the Hyksos was the expulsion of the ruling class of the Hyksos out of Egypt, but that plenty of Asiatics, like the Hyksos, remained in Egypt in all sorts of social capacities. Okay, in the 16th through 15th centuries, again, this will all be on a chart, uh, most of the large cities in Canaan were destroyed. By whom? by the 18th dynasty pharaohs, the dynasty that kicked out the Hyksos, kept moving and built the, the mightiest empire Egypt ever had, down to Nubia, but also into Syria, Palestine. The um, 16th through 11th centuries, many Asiatics, as I just said, remained in Egypt. Some were slaves. Some were hostage princes raised in Pharaoh's palace, in fact. Um, Ron Hendel talked about some of these Asiatics. Some of them have Egyptian names. Some keep their native Semitic names. In the 14th century BCE, east of the Arava, we have reference to the Bedouin, the nomads, or the Shasu of, and then it says Yahweh in the hieroglyphics. Yahweh is the proper name of the God of Israel. You can call me Professor, or you can call me William. My middle initials are supposed to be a mystery, Tom, but all right, William Henry Kovici Prop. Um, you can call me Professor, which is my job title, or by my name, okay? So Elohim, or God, is the job description of the protagonist of the Bible. But his real name uh, is pronounced Adonai by Jews today, but they pronounced it Yahweh. If you know Hebrew, you're confused because there's no W sound now, but there was then. So what are the Shasu of Yahweh, these Bedouin of Yahweh who live in the deserts um, southeast of modern Israel? Egyptian writing, which is not picture writing, by the way, not pictographic, um, has a way of indicating whether something is the name of a god, and it doesn't do that. It doesn't indicate any knowledge of what Yahweh is. Some people think it's a land. I have a personal favorite theory, which is that it was the name of their sheikh, an old man with a white beard, who by coincidence <laughs> became the god of three monotheistic religions, but that's just my theory. So this is happening in the 14th century. There are Shasu Bedouins of Yahweh in the deserts southeast of um, Israel, which is among the candidates for where Sinai Desert, Mount Sinai, would be. Also in the 14th century BC, Pharaoh Akhenaten says there is no god but the sunlight. And I am his earthly re its earthly representation. The god which is sunlight has no gender, so it is father and mother of all, and I am father and mother of all, which is one theory of why his statuary looks so strangely androgynous. 
Now, because Akhenaten is the image of the god Aten of sunlight, you may make no graven images. So there is no god but God, and thou shalt make no graven images. The first two commandments of the Ten Commandments are very much paralleled in Egypt in the 14th century BC. Also in the 14th century BC, these Apiru, who might be the Hebrews, are making trouble in the land of Canaan. In e the, Egyptian has an Egypt's, the Egyptians have an empire in the land of Canaan with city-state vassals that respond to them. We have hundreds of letters to the pharaoh, and some of them complain about these Apiru bands that are roaming around making trouble. Their names aren't Hebrew, but still. 13th century BCE. Ramesses II builds the cities of Pithom and Ramesses, mentioned, as Tom said, in Exodus chapter 1, as built by the Israelites. Also in the 13th century BC, we have the end of the Late Bronze Age and the fall of an international order of empire and kingdoms. Um, the Hittites are gone. The Assyrians retract. The Egyptians retract. Um, Ugarit is gone. If there was among the various destructions and wars at Troy that sound like what Homer might be talking about, the 12th century, late 13th century level is the one that people point to. There are in the 13th century and 12th century new burgeoning populations in the highlands of Canaan that must be the proto-Israelites. And to judge from their artifacts, however, they are indigenous. There's no evidence they came from outside the land. We could argue about the meaning, how meaningful that is. Um, also in the 13th century, Pharaoh Merneptah claims to have eradicated an ethnic group named Israel. So first proof that Israel exists is a statement that they no longer exist. Um, in the 12th century BC, the Philistines, who are mentioned in the context of the Exodus in the Bible, as the reason why they have to go around the land the other way, we can show that the Philistines have arrived from Egyptian sources. Um, and we have a Philistine ex expert visiting, um, I mean an expert on the Philistines, visiting UCSD. I can't see if he's here, but Professor Aaron Mayer in anthropology um, gave a lecture last week on the Philistines. In the 12th century, the Egyptians end their rule over Canaan. The natives are free. They're no longer being shipped as slaves to Egypt or being conscripted in the land of Canaan. Pharaoh and his armies have left, crossed the canals back to Egypt. Does this sound like good news for the historian that there's so much evidence? In fact, it's really bad news. What's relevant and what's not here? Do you notice? Do you notice? It starts at the 18th century and it runs through what things I've talked about, the 11th and 10th centuries BC. How can a historical event be smeared across 800 years and still be called an historical event? Or is the Exodus not really an event, but memories of various events and experiences? Or is one of these the Exodus and all the others are fakes? This is our problem. Moreover, beneath the gray zone, the gray band, you see I've given tentative dates for the sources. I've given the oldest reasonable dates for the sources. Most scholars would put them later. Um, the Song of the Sea, 10th century, well, uh, 12th century, J source, E source. 10th century, that's really pushing them way back. P source, later, the Torah, even later. Look at how many centuries, 13 centuries, are covered by this chart, separating the oldest hypothetically relevant events that we know happened and our sources. To complicate matters further, one of the most solid discoveries of 20th century and really late 19th century biblical scholarship, and it was discussed by Bernard Bato at our conference, is that the Israelites knew an old myth of the Amorites, the um, ancient Northwest Semitic peoples who became the Babylonians and the Assyrians of a certain, that's, I'm oversimplifying something there, and the Arameans and the Phoenicians and the Israelites and the Apiru and the Hyksos, they're all Amorites. An old Amorite myth whereby at the beginning of time, the storm god liberated the dry land from the depredations of the god of the sea by killing the sea and or the sea's serpentine alley, allies, monsters or a monster that lived in the sea, referred to as the great dragon or the um, serpent or Rahab or Leviathan, a name that appears in the Ugaritic tablets of the 14th century BCE 
and is found in the Bible as well. This myth was recovered for the past 150 years from Mesopotamian and Canaanite sources, and, and Syrian sources too. It's alluded to dozens of times in the Hebrew Bible, all in poetry, because the myth and epic is hidden in the poetry, not in the prose, and in fact survives into later Jewish apocalyptic speculations. Now, several of the passages that, quote, allude to this ancient myth of the combat of the storm god on the sea make an explicit, explicit connection to the Exodus. Here's one. The arm of God in days gone by cut Rahab in pieces, pierced the monster, dried up the sea, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over. This is a creation myth until the last words, and then it refers to the Exodus. I hate, by the way, the new international version. This is, since lest it appear to, I appear to be plugging it, it was just the simplest thing to click on. Um, it's a uh, misleading translation in general, but here this is a good translation. Um, or here's Psalm 77. I consider your works and miracles of long ago. Your ways are great. You redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Then it personifies the waters as seeing God and being convulsed. And there's clouds and a thunderstorm, lightning, the earth trembled, and, the, and a trampling, th trampling through the sea, which in other passages is part of the defeat of the sea monster by the storm god. But here, again, it's contextualized as the exodus from Egypt. Other passages will equate the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, with Leviathan, and they're probably thinking of a crocodile too, but also the cosmic monster. Oh, I don't have to look up here, it's on my screen, terrific. Um, so you can see, Pharaoh is compared to the great, ser the great cosmic serpent troubling the waters. In other words, the tradition that Yahweh created his people and established his kingship by fighting a battle by a sea or drawing or splitting it, the Israelites themselves connected this with a pre-Israelite creation myth. What conclusion do we draw from this? Some people will say what I just said. They made an association. If so, when? Later in time? My teacher Frank Cross, if I understood his rather cryptic utterances, seemed to think that when they watched the... Egyptians fall off the barges, something happened that made them think, oh, this is just like the creation myth. It never made any sense to me, but some people think, well, the eyewitnesses must have been impressed by some event involving water and a storm that reminded them of this myth. Other scholars make a claim that will sound far-fetched, but again, given the, given the long time spans, it isn't that far-fetched, that it's all a myth. It's a myth turned into history. When the Israelites abandoned the genre of epic poetry that we know the Canaanites had and started writing historical prose and started telling stories not in which Yahweh defeated Egypt, but in which Moses and Aaron defeated the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. When the actors became people, sort of anchored in time, the basic plot stayed the same, and a myth was turned into history. It's a, it's a respectable academic theory.